What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel, guys. The boy and LFC back again, guys. I need a top shelf video for you guys today. I have a special guest on the panel. First time joining on Ryan LFC, Simon. Thank you very much to take your time and coming on the show. I really appreciate it. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, Ryan. Really, really appreciate you having me on. You know, I've been watching your channel for some time as well. Keep up the good work and hope you're staying safe. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, always a family and everything. They're doing well, you know. Can't complain. All as well from that perspective. My family is doing well. You know, work is also going quite well and taking things one day at a time. That's all we can take it from here. We have to live our life, do what we have to do. So, all in all, I'm blessed. I'm I'm grateful. You know, what each day as it comes, we give thanks. Perfect, perfect. But. Guys, this interview is a little bit different. I want to separate myself from many YouTubers. So we're going to start this interview, guys. Simon, early place of birth, early life. All right, no problem. Born and raised in St. Andrew, Jamaica in the early 90s. Not all hospital. Grew up in, on Riddles Road near, near Calabar High School. From then on in, I moved into the Arcadia area, Kingston 8 side. Been living in Northeast St. Andrew for quite some time now, to be quite frank. And that's essentially how I grew up. Went to Hillel Academy Prep School, Hillel Academy High School. Went on to the University of the West Indies. And now doing what I love, working in broadcasting, television, radio, online, doing sports, you know, and Football, the sport that I've loved ever since I was five years old is part of my life. So I'm quite thankful and grateful that it has played a role for me in this journey to be able to, to travel the world essentially and to be able to meet different people from all corners of the globe and also people in the diaspora and meet people like you. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. But we'll get back to that. I want to just focus more on your early life and stuff. But in your old soul, how many brother and sister you grew up with? So, I was born. I'm the last of six kids. My, I have three brothers and I have two sisters. My my father had four children before he met my mother, and my mother had two. Me being the last one, so three brothers, two sisters. I'm the youngest, but the tallest. But we all get along quite well, even though we may be half siblings. We keep in touch almost on a daily basis. We have like a WhatsApp group where all of us keep in touch together, all of us as siblings and see how everybody's doing because my siblings are not all on the island. I only have one brother on the island. I have three siblings in, in the States, in Florida. I have a brother in Dubai who I'm visiting right now. So it's scatter scatter all over the globe where that is concerned. But we have a very, very solid relationship, all of us. We get along quite well and... You know, I'm, I'm grateful that I have persons that are actually siblings older than me that I can gain knowledge and wisdom from so that I know certain experiences I may face in life that I'm able to handle it head on in and being able to, to handle daily daily challenges and, and be able to make good decisions in life. Definitely. And next question for me, I want to ask you, you know, a lot of Jamaican kids grew up on the road and poverty and stuff so what it is like for your family also to grow up what it is yeah. like to um if you um you come up to poverty you have it rough you have it easy yeah i understand what you mean to to be honest i've been grateful that i was brought up in what jamaicans might say a, a middle class society i born in you know kingston 10 kingston 8 era being lived in northeast st andrew what people might consider uptown i would say that i'm grateful that i had parents that sent me to private school i'm grateful that i had parents that were quite supportive for me gave me moral support and you know gave me everything that i wanted i wouldn't say i was a spoiled child but i knew that i could depend on them whatever it may be whether it be moral support or financial or otherwise being able to have that solid backbone that i had in terms of, you could say, challenges that you touched on quite briefly. When I was 17, my, my father passed away, and I was in my latter years of high school, entering sixth form. So 
that was a difficult period because he was essentially the breadwinner of my family. My mother was more so working on a part-time basis and taking care of me as I was a minor at the time. So going into sixth form, I worked full time, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into, you know, my, my career path and opportunities later on. But it was from sixth form that I was working 40 hours a week, plus going to class, plus doing schoolwork. Well, all my other class mates, you know, on the weekend, they're going to the beach, they're going to Kochi, them going Mobe, them going off to Ireland, to Miami to see them family for the weekend and little things like that. Well, I'm working, I'm grafting, I'm helping to pay the bills, I'm building up my resume. But although I don't wish any experience to anybody like I did in terms of losing a family member, losing a, a parent, it helped me to be a strong person because it helps me to be more independent and not dependent on persons. I know that if I wanted to accomplish something in life or there's something that I needed, I am the one that have to go out and work for it. And whether there are benefits or consequences, I am the one that's going to have to live with it. So I appreciate the life lesson that it gave me. And to this very day, you know, I just live my life in a manner that I know that. The decisions that I make, I ensure that I'm willing to live with either the benefits or the consequences with every single one of my decisions. Well, perfect. My condolences to your father. So, mommy doing okay and everything, though? Yeah, mommy is doing quite well, actually. She settled down overseas and uh, got married again. So, I'm kind of a stepfather now, essentially. And he treats my mother well, and I... I know that he will certainly treat her quite quite well, even though she doesn't live with me anymore. But mommy is doing quite well health-wise and, and also doing well me mentally and physically as well. So I'm grateful for, for that perspective. And, and mommy is doing good. My siblings are well. So from that perperspective, my family are is in the A-OK. -A 100%. So which school you grew up, which school you attend at the earlier age, at basic school, come right up? All right, so in terms of basic school, I went to a school called Creative Minds Preschool. It located on, was located on Roxbury Avenue, so that's off Acadia, off near in the Constant Spring vicinity. That's where I started in the early 90s. And then immediately after that, I went to Hillel Academy Prep School. And then after Hillel Academy Prep, I wanted to go to, to Campion for high school, but... I didn't pass for their, them on GSAT, so I ended up going to Hillel Academy High School. But reflecting on that experience as well, I don't, now in my 20s, I don't regret the time I went going to Hillel Academy High School because it helped me to broaden my horizon on different matters, different life choices I can make, different career path options as well. Because at Hillel Academy, they taught us not only in the classroom, but how to swim, how to speak three languages, how to manage decisions that I'm going to make on a basis because it helped me prepare for the life that I'm living today, currently. So I don't regret the time that I had in high school, especially at Hillel. I'm not saying that public school would not have given me a similar sort of experience, but in terms of the wide array of subjects, the wide array of opportunities that it presented to me, then I'm grateful that I was able to attend Hillel Academy and then shortly after that go to the University of the West Indies. Well, definitely. You went to university, so that's great. So you finish up university, get your master's, get every single thing where you get. So I really appreciate your share that knowledge to the viewers. So next question for you. How you get into journalism? How you get in? <laughs> Wow, it's quite a journey, I tell you. Well, I guess it, where it all started was perhaps in the late 1990s. Around 1997, 1998, thereabouts, I would always walk with a book with me. And in that book, I would have scores of matches, results, teams, statistics. And from then, I would say I would develop knowledge and, you know, looking over that information look at Riga Boys' results from the 1990s onwards and be able to regurgitate the scores, who scored in that game, the tournaments, the players, 
And an opportunity presented itself in the 2006 period. I was 12 years old at the time. I, I got the chance to meet veteran broadcaster uh, at the time, yeah, Stratton Palmer from KLA Sports Radio and Jeffrey Maxwell. And from then I got an opportunity to be an analyst with them for the 2006 World Cup that was hosted in Germany. And that caught the ears and eyes of Television Jamaica. So that's how I was able to get the opportunity to be the analyst for Television Jamaica in the final for 2006, 12 years old at the time. I guess where you could say the real genesis was, though, in terms of opening this door of journalism was 2010. It was a sports quiz show called Set Play on CBM television. And I entered the competition. There were 16 representatives. Set Play was a, a football quiz show. And yeah, I remember, I, I remember, I remember that man. You just you mash up that competition <laughs> so bad as it's not even you're so quick on the buzzer and you have to be a good person to quick on the buzzer. So they always put the person who very quick in school challenge quiz to go on up to, <laughs> to to press the buzzer. I was watching back some of the clippings on Instagram or your post, and I'm telling you, they'll even give the guy a second to hit the button. Yeah, I tell you, as soon as uh, part of the question was read, I, I had an idea what the answer would be in terms of how a question might be formulated. So I guess that helped me when the moderator, quiz master, was asking me that question. So winning that competition, becoming the analyst for CVM TV for 2010 World Cup, that's when it really cemented to me that, yes, wow, journalism could actually be a career path for me because I didn't think about it even at 12 that this could be a career path for me. I was thinking about communications. I was thinking about economics. I was thinking even about physics as well, because those were my strongest areas in school, translating as well. But it wasn't until 2010 that I said, yes, journalism, sports journalism, this can actually be a career path for me. Let me research what subjects I need to do in my latter years of high school. Let me continue honing my craft currently, whatever opportunities comes my way so that I can develop a decent resume and CV, you know? Yeah, 100%. I was I, I really surprised to see you on the television at a young age. You know, me is the same age, and actually, I thought your, your, um, your physique look, you look much more bigger than me. So when I look, I always say, oh, this guy know a lot about football, and I didn't know you um, me is a said age. So that surprised me, the knowledge that you have at a tender age to do journalists. This thing is not easy. You're a multitask journalist, not talking about football alone, track and field. Um, I'm going to get into it, but 2010, mm -hmm. talk me through that experience to be the panel on TVJ. Man, that was a surreal experience. Amazing. I, just to be in the same room, just to be in the same on the same panel with Theodore Tapa Whitmore, the head coach, Warren Bart, the goalkeeper coach, Andre Virtue, you know, amongst many, many other people, Michael Hall, the ambassador to Spain, and just being able to do what I know best, speak football and being able to reel off information about teams, players, strengths, weaknesses. I felt in my element, I felt in my comfort zone. And for me, it was an experience that's I'll never forget and I'll always look back at it as an experience that really helped me to be where I am today. So I look at that experience, that exposure as the, the starting point of currently where I am in my path. Definitely, definitely. But my next question I want to go on to your travel with the Jamaican, um, with the um, JFF. Do you are part of the JFF? Do you um, get salary or whatever? Or you do it for free for the JFF. I want to know your experience because I see you travel with the JFF with a lot of time with the Reggae Boys team, the Jamaican team. For people who know, the Reggae Boys team is the Jamaican national team. And I saw you travel to um, the Copa a couple of years ago. And I see you with the Caribbean mm. Cup. You always been that journalist for travel with the Jamaican team. The experience over the years, you travel with a lot of different coaches, a different player and stuff. Take me through that. Um, what are you experience with the Reggae Boys? Right. So, it, it, like I said, everything started from 2010. Roy Simpson, the team manager of the Reggae Boys, was also on the panel for 2010. He 
saw my knowledge, knew my abilities. I gave him a potential 60-player roster of players that were eligible to represent Jamaica. He was impressed by that. He put through my contact information to Janice Rose Brown, the director of operations, and you know, I knew Captain Horace Burrell prior, but Captain Horace Burrell kind of gave the nod to Mr. Rose Brown, the green lighter, go ahead to have me on board on a, on a part-time basis. And from around 2010, 2010 to around 2020, mid 2020, I operated in a capacity of analyst, statistician, and to an extent, overseas scout as well, did a bit of social media work as well, posting on the Facebook page and the Twitter accounts. Not anymore, though, but those were some of the experiences that I've had with the JFF. So currently, I'm not doing anything right now. My full-time position is with Television Jamaica as the, as the broadcast sports presenter. But in terms of my experiences with the JFF, yes, the Copa America 2015 in Chile, and in addition to that, that friendly international against Chile, which Jamaica won, I was helping Winfred Schaefer to look at the strengths and weaknesses of the opposition, especially Chile, and to, to come out victorious and beat world number three at the time, Copa America champions at the time. You know, I think I played a, a decent role in helping us get, it, get over the line. The Caribbean Cup 2017 in Martinique as well. I mean, we'll get into the coaches later on in, in, in depth in terms of the different styles and, and strategics and, and all of that, but... What I enjoyed the most from the ruling is recommending players that are eligible to represent Jamaica, players that are on form, players that's, that can add value to the program. And I'm quite strategic. I could name out all 124, but are all of them committed? No. Are all of them going to be willing to travel nine hours and willing to, to come back in economy? No. That's why it's strategic in terms of who will fit into the, the 11, what best fit they will bring to the team as well and sort of what they'll bring to the dressing room as well because you might have certain individuals that will be wanting to sit in the corner lunchtime and not then gel in with the team and you have some individuals that are just going to come just want to take selfies get 10,000 likes on Instagram and for their national player so from that perspective it's been a journey it's been a quite a journey I tell you but I've enjoyed every single minute of it Definitely. My next, um, the Olympic team in, 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 in London, Usain Bolt, you probably saw Usain Bolt last him only come last. He pull up in, in that race, basically. So we don't want to put down the legend name like that. He pull up. So what are you experiencing that is track and field, guys? This is, I'm telling you guys, this have Simon have a lot of, um, he can touch on any other sports. Not like Ryan LFC, a boxing in Liverpool. This is where I'm trying to get out of this Liverpool team. I don't want nobody to box me. So <laughs> Simon is a very good analyst. He can talk about sports. Talk to me about the track and field. What that experience in London? Yeah, so that was the World Championships 2017. So that was Bolt's send-off, more or less. Fortunately, I got to see him get that bronze medal in the 100 meters. But yes, the disappointment, of course, was to see the, the 4 by 100 meter relay where he wasn't able to complete the race. But to be able to communicate with the athletes immediately after the race, the, the Johan Blakes of this world, the Elaine Thompsons, the Us Usain Bolt in particular as well, Omar McLeod, that was a, a different experience for me. And to be honest with you, it was quite demanding. Why I say demanding? Because the events are immediately one after the other and day after the day. So when you finish doing your interviews and when you finish sending it to the, the news department, when I was at KLAS at the time, it's midnight, 1 a.m., and you know you have to get up at 6 o'clock the next morning to grab your laptop, go to the stadium for 9 o'clock start so you can have your notes prepared and you have all your questions prepared for when the athletes start. So demanding in the sense where sleep was limited and you know that it was just about when the race is done you have your questions ready for the interview and once the interview is done you send it back to station and you prepare your reports you get you try to find a coach to say coach is there any injuries in the camp you know what's the order of the the relay is you know is there going to be a new person added to the relay it was cold as well i mean i enjoyed the cold but i mean different conditions that you're going to be involved in 
it's London, so you have on I've been on a jacket every day. The time difference, it takes a day or two to get adjusted to the the time and to avoid the jet lag and all of that. So but I wouldn't trade that experience for anything else. Being able to put myself in that atmosphere, track and field, something that I would say is quite new to me in terms of reporting, but something I've garnered experience in over time. I'm grateful for it. Definitely. What about your experience with the Talawa? They win 2020. Um, you have some great players in that team. You were a part of that success with the Talawa. They win two 2020 um, Cups and they come what, third or fourth. Talk me through that mm -hmm. um, experience working with the Talawa. Yes, that's right. So 2013 to 2016, I operated as a statistician or analyst of the team. So not only providing information in terms of reports and data to the coaching staff, but also preparing videos for the for the team as well in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of the opposition. So you'd say, OK, guys, this is where this batsman, you should bowl to him. Dwayne Bravo can't hit over the offside. Where I say, OK, guys, Pollard, if you bowl to him short on, on leg stump, then we can get a catch at fine leg. So it's just about finding the weaknesses in the opposition so we can know when to bowl, where to bowl. And I think that paid dividends for us because if you look since twenty six post-2016, it's been quite about a rocky journey. You know, as you know, 2019, we didn't even make it to the, the, the playoffs of the competition. It was quite embarrassing. 2020 last year, we only won three games in the competition. And 2017 and 2018 were quite a seesaw years, fourth, fourth and third. And we, we lost our, our dominance at home. You know, one thing under my, you know, playing my, my role with the team at home, we're quite a dominant force. But post-2016, we haven't been that that sort of dominant force at home, but it was one of the most best experiences in my life, to be honest with you, just being in the same dressing room as Chris Gale, Andre Russell, Chris Lynn, colorful characters, I tell you. And you had Kumar Sangakar, uh, more literal, and you know, one of the, the funniest guys as well, Jai Wardner in the mix as well, Rusty Tehran, Daniel Vittori, who is quiet in the dressing room, but on the pitch, he's He's a noisy character. So just to see different sorts of individuals in a dressing room. And I think what paid dividends for the success of the, the Tala was, especially during that spell, 2013 to 2016, was the local or domestic-based players, all of them were Jamaican. So I think that gelled in quite well. So the only non-Jamaicans in the team or the non-Jamaicans in the coaching staff or support staff were the were the overseas-based players, the Rusty Terrans of this world, the Kumar Sangakars. So the, the overseas-based players were only non-Jamaicans. We are basically a local coaching staff as well. So I think we're able to gel quite well, and there was chemistry and cohesion, and that led to the success of the franchise in the first four years of the competition. So what do you think West Indies need to do to come back on top? Do you think it's too much politics, or you think the player them now playing in different country, making a lot of money. They're turning back on the West Indies team. So what do you think need to fix up for the West Indies to go better on the Talawa? Well, to be quite frank with you, well, starting with West Indies, I, where Test cricket is concerned, I don't see a bright future where Test cricket is concerned because we know once these guys can hit two balls into the stands, India will be calling, Australia will be calling, Pakistan will be calling, Dubai, Abu Dhabi will be calling and they'll be able to get the fund to take care of their family and have the pension secured. So that's why I think test cricket, I don't see the West Indies rising to the dominance that we saw from 1980 to 1995. But I do think we'll be a force to be reckoned with in 2020 cricket for years to come. And even T10, if that booms and gets into the Olympic Games in 2028, I still think in white ball cricket that we can have some dominance but in terms of the red ball cricket, if there's anything we can even do marginally to improve that, I still think regionally, in the regional four-day championship, we don't play enough games. It's 10 matches, basically, and compared to the Indias, the Australias, the South Africas, the New Zealands, the Pakistans, they're playing much more first-class cricket than us. And these are players that are averaging in the 40s and 50s, while our players are still averaging in the 20s and 30s. Can we spend some time at the wickets, you know? That is something that that's going to be quite critical. We should so, each batsman or plane should be yeah. Go ahead. No, continue. What I was going to finish on saying is that 
each batsman playing test cricket or red ball cricket should tell themselves, if you're a batsman, let me bat 200 balls. Because if I bat 200 balls, I'm going to make a century, a worst case scenario. I'm going to get 70, 80 runs. Tell themselves, put a mindset. If I'm going to bat more deliveries, I'm going to get more runs. Tell yourself, put it in your mind instead of, you know, approaching it like, oh, I have three, four days left to play this encounter. So the approach is, is something that's going to be critical. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally. Because both in England um, and Pakistan and these teams, what a difference with the West Indies player that's going to the 2020 to make a lot of money. England do have that same problem. They want they, they, they still have players who is playing in the, in the team and play test matches. What a difference. They get more money playing for England? Yes, you do. And, and the county leagues in England, they're compensated quite well. And you... They would say, okay, we're going to sign Ryan on a five-year contract and, and have a... So your future is secured. But four-day cricket in the Caribbean, it's on a year-by-year -year basis. Today, I could be playing for the Jamaica Scorpions. Next year, I could be out of a food. I could be out of a contract. I could be sitting at home doing nothing. But there's longevity in England. You know that you have a security. Three-year deal, there's a minimum two-year contract for for majority of players in the league. You only get a one-year contract if they know you're coming to the back end of your career, late 30s. So that job security, for me, is going to be critical moving forward for West Indies cricket. Johnny Grave is working on it, but we still have some more uh, cash flow situations to work on and new streams of income that we have to generate into our region in particular. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We're going to move back to you. Um, what would you say your biggest achievement in journalism? 2012, um, 2012, um, mm. the award with the Prime Minister, Young Award. What, what running through your head when you get um, that award? Would you say that be? Would you say that is your biggest um, success in um, in your journalism? Mm. Yeah, you broke up a little bit there, but I got the essence of what you're trying to say. Yes, it was I could, my proudest moment, hands down, my proudest moment in journalism, being the recipient of the Prime Minister's Youth Award in Journalism 2012, the youngest in my category, 19 years of age, and still to date the youngest to receive such award. So it's just a surreal experience once again, you know, too. To, have, to go on that stage, receive the the trophy from Prime Minister at the time, Portia Simpson Miller, and being able to embrace with her and, and communicate with her. For me, that is the proudest moment so far of my journalism career, for sure. I would say that is Ryan LFC biggest moment, meeting the Prime Minister, play for the Prime Minister team um, back in Jamaica and win the competition. So. Good to see Ryan LFC can say he kissed the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Portia Simpson Miller. Big up yourself. I love you so much. I appreciate everything that you've done for um, the community team in your consequences. So big up to Mama P. So we're going to talk about the reggae boys just a little bit. What do you think about the reggae boys now? Mm. No. Okay. In a nutshell, the reggae boys have tremendous potential. It's a team blessed with abilities, strengths that can go up against and be competitive with every team in our region. Right now, as we speak, I still feel we're a handful of pieces left to complete the puzzle if we really want to take Qatar seriously. I think what we have right now in terms of a foundation, it's solid. But depth for me is number one on my priority, especially in the period of time that we're living in right now. Because of the pandemic, we're going to be playing qualifiers every three, four days. And plus you're going to add travel into that as well. So you can imagine what a toll it's going to be on the player. So, you're going to need depth, you know. I could play at home today and we're going to need Ryan to play on the road against Costa Rica. And we're going to need 100% from both of us to get those points. 
As it relates to the team itself, I don't have an issue with the team. My concern is more so with the the management, more so the, the head coach, because he, he took over in his second stint in 2016. And at that time, we already were eliminated from qualifying for 2018 World Cup. We knew we weren't qualifying for 2018. You know, we're eliminated under Schaefer. So you knew that you were preparing for what? 2022 World Cup qualifiers. And you knew you had four years to prepare for that. You had two Gold Cups. You also have, in addition to that, a couple of CONCACAF Nations League tournaments and a Caribbean Cup, plus a sprinkle of a little friendlies in between. So you're talking six types of competitions. And still, we're in 2021 with less than 10 months to go before qualifiers, and we still haven't been able to get the pieces in together. No time really to gel, to have cohesion. That's my biggest issue. Why not have introduced these new faces 2016, 2017, 2018, so that they could have had time, energy to be able to gel into the team. So that's my biggest concern, saving this until the last minute. So that's why I'm pointing the fingers at the head coach where this is concerned, that in four years, going on five years, now is the time that we're going to see new faces in the squad and not when we had the opportunities to experiment, which were the Gold Cup, which were the Caribbean Cup, which were the Nations League. So that's my biggest concern right now. Well, for me, I think the Jamaican, when you look at the crop of player, we have, we have um, Bobby Reed playing very good in the Premier League. We have Robert Morrison. We have Leon Bailey. We have Shaman Nicholson. We have some great players. We have O'Neill Fisher. We have Junior Flemings. Goalkeeper, we have Andre Blake. Mm -hmm. Low, we have Thank a you. very good team. And for me, for the regular boys, not qualify for the World Cup come 2022. That's going, for me, I think Tapa Whitmore, he has done a fantastic job in what they give him. I don't think the mm -hmm. JFF, I don't mm -hmm. think the JFF enough back Tapa Whitmore and to give him the tool. I think Tapa needs someone, he needs more coach around him, more coach of experience, more coach of the idea to prepare the team. When you look at the England, the liver um the, the England, the Liverpool, the Barcelona, the Real Madrid, mm -hmm. the um Bayern Munich. Right. They name them the national team Spain. When you look at them, coaching staff is a big unit. And I think this is where Jamaica continue to fail. We don't have good coaches. Tapa himself, as a coach, as a leader, he has to, he has to, um, I don't want to bash him too hard, but he has to can um, talk to the um, the media properly. You have to more often. Mm -hmm. I think Tapa kind of a little bit late, but that's impersonality. What you're doing, you are the leader for this organization. And the federation, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if you hear that league tape with um, Low. That's not a good look. And when you look at it, we don't have a main sponsor. I see Leon Bailey yeah. talking about the Reggae Boys team. The only way we're not going to qualify is going to, to, to be the manager. If we continue doing this after stuff pitch, every single time player coming to the national team, they're talking about money, discuss money. Two days before, Gold Cup last year, um, two years ago in the United States, the same thing, we continue, continue making the same mistake. No leader. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean. And I understand your concern there as well. It's... It's really embarrassing that you're, we're still in 2021 and still having these conversations when Paul Hall, Dion Burton, Fitzroy Simpson were the same players having these conversations almost 20 years ago and talking about the same sorts of figures as well. So I can understand your concern and I'm by no means saying that you're wrong. You're absolutely right. These are not issues that, that you should be, be having, especially at this stage when you're on the verge of a qualification cycle you want the players on your side. You don't want division. You don't want at this point in time because it can be the make or break of a campaign. So that's why we're now in the month of February. We're going into March. Qualifiers are September. Gold Cup is July. Get everything in place latest June. And when I mean yeah. everything, I'm talking about funding, players' passports, every striking thing, everything. They they need to do that. They need to do that because this is our one of our best chance to qualify for the World Cup. If you look at the World Cup qualify game, them we have Mexico a couple of years ago. We do very well at the Azteca, get a points. 
And to me, this Mexico team is not great like a um, couple of years ago when we were get a points from them. So if we don't shake up ourselves and if you look at it, everything's set in our way. But first and foremost, we need to get more points away from home. We are very poor when it comes on to play against South American team. When you're talking about Panama, Costa Rica, United States, Mexico. If we really want to qualify and do us for this World Cup, we have to get points away from home. And that's our weakest, weakest links over the years. That's our weakest link. Mm -hmm. We don't get a lot of points away from home. And we have to fix that come. We have, a, we have some great player. We can make it happen. And the JFF have to have this in mind. It's not 20 years ago you're dealing with players. You're dealing most of these players in the, on the Jamaican national team. They go to college. They study business. They know this stuff. So you cannot play around like 10, 15 years ago. We have the same. No, we have to fix up other nations. And corporate Jamaica need to come on board. This is what, when you look at it, when we have more overseas coach, we have more sponsor. We have more sponsor because the person who in charge, they're not going out and sell the product. Where can I get one of these Jamaican jerseys to buy? Where? Where can I go online to get one of these Jamaican jerseys to buy? I have to buy bootleg. I have to buy it in Canada store where <laughs> some of these things are bootleg. This is our national team. When I look at Instagram, me, myself, can put a business on Instagram. JFF need to do stuff. They're not doing, they're just taking, taking away, taking away. And this is what we have to have people lead and lead properly. We don't have good leader. Kudos to Captain Burrell. He doing a great job. He could do more, but he makes sure a lot of stuff done before player come and all of this stuff. Whether we like it or not, he has done a great job. Instagram, start to sell the Jamaican Cup. Start to sell. You have Leon Bailey, Nike. This thing is very easy. Easy to market yourself. It's not, it's 2020. 2020 we're in a 2021 we're in a and we talking about relax sponsor we should have all of these bobby reed put them on t-shirt leon bailey number seven i would buy one but not from a booklet store it not go back into the federation so we need to find way out to get sponsorship and we need to find way out to make money we have leon bailey one of the biggest product from jamaica bobby reed Ravel Maris, everything you touch on Ravel Maris is a goal. He's 27. Mm -hmm. But that's all I have to say about the yeah. JFF. They need, if they need to get help, if they need to get pass play on board to help them out, you were doing a fantastic job. You do a, a fantastic job. I watch you every day talk about player who can represent for Liverpool. What do you, um, for Jamaica, what do you think about um, Nathan Redman from Southampton? Nathan Redmond, great player, would certainly add pace to the, to the left-hand side or right-hand side. And when you think about what we're trying to do, whether it's a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1, he's a player that can suit in quite, quite well to Jamaica. And I think that it would be a smooth transition for him. And I think a lot of Jamaicans have been quite excited recently as he was in a music video and he was holding up a Jamaican flag. He's talking with his agent right now and analyzing his options and it, it, it's like a scenario where he's thinking if, if he doesn't make the England squad for the Euros then he'll consider Jamaica so that's the sort of conversations right now that he's having I don't see it happening right now but at the end of this year it's a possibility but right now as I speak I don't think it will happen but he's certainly a player that I would certainly embrace into the national setup and trust me, that national stadium is going to be rammed when fans come back into the stands. Trust me, you need your ticket back to Jamaica. Listen, I will definitely, I will definitely be a part. This is why I want to cover more Jamaican stuff. I want to interview more Jamaican players. I don't want to stick in Liverpool. I want my country. I know this is the internet. The more I like and the more attention you give Jamaica, is it better? Player like Nathan Redman and these can come and represent. But when we hear stuff like we're leaked with law coming out, you think Nathan Redman want to find himself in this? It's not a good look. And the JFF need to fix it. They need to fix yeah. it. But as I said, Simon, you are a 
great journalist. You have a big future ahead, and I really appreciate you stopping by. And also, I am really a big fan of you. Last Gold Cup, I will start um, talking about the last Gold Cup, and some of the players have to come to your channel to know all of the players who are available to play for Jamaica. And listen, Gold Cup, I, I didn't know a lot of um, the players, and I learned it from you, your video. I write them down when they call the name. And so, yeah. so you are doing a fantastic job. Guys, remember, if you want to go and subscribe to Reggae Boys Commentary, I think that's the number one channel when you're talking about Jamaica. Anything, the link will be in the bio. And make sure you um, subscribe to him channel. Tell him Ryan LFC send you. So, Simon, what do you have to say before we take off? Do they, did I miss anything of your journey or you want to add to the panel well to all of your subscribers and to everyone watching this video what i will tell them is that everything in life it takes time but once you believe you will achieve and i'm telling it straight up i know you it's something that you've heard every each and every single day but as somebody that has experienced it patience don't worry because good things and great things in particular take time, whether that may be a future job opportunity, whether it may be a trip that you've been planning, whether it may be, you know, the, the, the woman that you want to get married to, everything will fall into place in due time. So don't worry, just keep doing what you need to do on that same path and things will fall into place. So Simon, what would you tell a young fans if they want to be a sports analyst, they want to be a journalist, what um, knowledge you can give them? In terms of those that want to enter the industry, those that are interested in entering the industry, well, first thing first, read, watch different sporting events, not only stick to just football, cricket, and track and field, which are the three most popular in Jamaica. Widen your knowledge base a bit because we have 55 sports on the island and most of them are gaining international traction as well. And that help us, helps to broaden your scope so that when you're having conversations, when you're interviewing athletes, it will develop. But in terms of entering the industry and being able to get the exposure that I did, you know, I'm grateful for the work for what KLA Sports Radio did for me when I was 12 and when I was in my early 20s as well for giving me opportunities there. They're a, a radio station, a broadcast that gives opportunities to young men and young women and I think whether it's commentating, whether it's analysis, whether it's reporting, then it's an avenue that you, you certainly can consider, even if it means on a part-time basis or for a short period of time. In terms of the path that I took and in terms of how I was able to develop knowledge, like I said, and carrying a book with information and such, and looking over that information, watching over videos, because that helped me to be able to retain the data and retain the knowledge that I'm able to to have today so those are some important points and in terms of as you've entered the industry and you become more established learn another language spanish french be able to to communicate in at least one of those two because it will certainly help you in the long run definitely definitely guys listen carefully and take what simon telling you i'm still learning i'm still learning from simon so guys it's a pleasure Thank you very much, Simon Preston, to share your story with Ryan LFC. More to come. Until next time, from the boy Ryan LFC, I'd like to say peace out. Thanks for watching.